welcome to this lecture on VHDL uh, in the course uh, digital system design with PLDs and FPGAs. Uh, the last lecture we have gone through uh, the use of multiple architectures, uh, two models of description one is uh, uh, you know data flow model and the behavioral model. So, let us look at the, the slide uh, when you have uh, the multiple architecture for a single entity. Um, it can be used uh, you know you can have a scenario where you write a quick code for simulation or another architecture which is kind of after the simulation you can do it for synthesis. Maybe you write one architecture for minimum area and uh, the one for maximum speed, one could be for FPGA, one could be for PLD or ASIC and so on. And we have seen uh, the design flow. Uh, we start with the VHDL source code which is functionally simulated, the code is simulated not the circuit uh, to remove the logical and syntax errors and iterate here. Then you go for synthesis where the logic circuit is created and you can do a logic simulation. Uh, if you correctly code, if you correctly uh, write the synthesizable code this step may not be necessary. So, you can do a logic simulation which is a both these simulations have no delay because it is not mapped to the device yet. Then once um, you do the synthesis you can go for uh, the process of place and route or fitting uh, place and route is called PAR and um, you give IO constraints and timing constraints uh, do quick uh, static timing analysis depending on the delay of the block and when uh, you iterate there and when everything is okay you do timing simulation which might take time for complex uh, you know circuits then everything works fine then you can program the FPGA. So, basically you have an editor, you have a synthesis tool, constraint editor, a PAR tool, a programmer, a static timing analysis tool and a simulator which does all these you know functional logic or timing simulation. So, these are the kind of the tools we use and we have seen the data flow model the, the, the first code as an example we have seen is a data flow model where it shows the data flow this is the input and you know the output gets assigned and uh, this use a construct called venal statement which is used in the concurrent body. So, this is a concurrent body everything in the architecture declare uh, statement region is concurrent and this is a concurrent statement there is another statement called with select uh, which we will see later. There is another way of writing using the logical uh, kind of operators um, as I said uh, this can be cumbersome when the data size is uh, large and uh, so here even if uh, whether it is 3 or 31 it does not matter this works. So, this is very concise you need not worry about the, uh, the circuit you end up with these are very simple. Uh, thing to synthesize. So, the synthesis tool will make sure that whatever you have written uh, the equivalent uh, circuit depending on the device uh, in an optimal way is implemented. Uh, so, that is the data flow model and we have talked about the concurrency um, as I said uh, there is an issue like uh, it is not like unlike the sequential languages when you write some statements uh, in a specific order um, in a sequential language uh, one after the other is executed. But when you simulate basically simulate a VHDL statement sequentially written concurrent statement like this um, a top to bottom evaluation will not yield the correct results. So, uh, the simulator has to resolve concurrency from the sequentially written code because here uh, it is written in the opposite of the data flow. Data flow uh, is from a b to x, x to y, y to z we have written in the opposite way. So, z and y will be wrong x will be the correct thing if you do the top to bottom evaluation. Uh, those simulators job is to resolve the concurrency um, from the sequentially written code, but it is not a big issue for uh, the synthesis tool because uh, the expressions are there and uh, you know whichever order it is written does not matter you end up with the, with the same circuit. So, in this case at least for um, in this case the simulators has a hard job than the, the synthesis tool. We have looked at the, the behavioral model where we use everything else is same where we use a sequential body called process and 
process has a sensitivity less we put the inputs there when anything changes in the input it computes from top to bottom once and it uses sequential statement like if then case when and all that and before the begin you can declare the variables um, you can declare constants you can define procedures or function which are visible to uh, the body um, so and um, you have a problem if you miss something in the sensitivity list because here you see in the statement there are two inputs but if you do not write both inputs then the simulator will give a behavior uh, which the synthesis tool will not be able to kind of uh, uh, you know produce because synthesis tool does not bother about the real time behavior it looks at the code and generate the circuit code say if A is equal to B equals get 1 else equals get 0. So, it just create an equality comparator, but uh, the simulator simulates an equality comparator which uh, works only when A changes. If B changes next time A changes um, it, it works correctly if, if it does B does not change uh, till the A changes. Otherwise uh, if the B changes it does not uh, compare you know something like that. So, um, so there is a problem a compatibility problem with the simulation and synthesis. The solution is to uh, write all the input signal in the sensitivity list and some tools warn you and if the tool does not warn you it is a dangerous thing because you simulate and see some behavior and this in a complex case sometime it can be in very simple case you will be able to identify but in a complex case. Um, it can create an issue. So, one need to take care of this particular issue of missing signals in the sensitivity list and uh, as I said there is nothing great about using processes do not get kind of uh, you know worried about this word processes. If you have uh, a, a block with inputs A, B, C you write A, B, C in the in the sensitivity list you use if case uh, loops etcetera to define the behavior of this output in terms of A, B, C that is all what is required. Uh, as I said when I say uh, write the input signal in the sensitivity list uh, little more detail is required maybe today's lecture will uh, throw light on it and we will go ahead. And we also said when you have multiple processes both are concurrent say you have two blocks. Uh, they share an input called A. So, you write two processes and if A changes both will be computed uh, for the same event ok. It is not that the simulator com cannot compute at the same time need not be, but uh, if A changes at 100 nanosecond uh, both these computation will happen for that particular 100 nanosecond event uh, that is the meaning of concurrency. So, let us go ahead and uh, let us come to today's uh, part and here we see a model of description called structural model of the VHDL code which enables us to do the hierarchical design or the top down design. And we have seen already how we have designed the CPU top down you know we put a black box CPU say level 1 where it was an interconnection of various components. So, we will see how that can be uh, done in VHDL using the structural code that is a basic idea. So, uh, when you have a top level entity which is built up of uh, the black boxes from the level 2 or the, the bottom level components uh, then what is done is that you the top level entity you give a name uh, as usual you define the inputs and outputs ok. Now, the game is that we are not going to describe uh, the behavior of the, the circuit, but we are going to say this entity uh, the architecture of this entity is composed of the interconnection of various components that is what is going to be stated in the architecture statement region. And for that we need we need to say what are the components used ok. So, maybe uh, you take these two components they may be same components ok. Uh, you can have a, a same component instantiated multiple times um, in, in an architecture. So, 
you have to declare uh, in the architecture declaration region before the begin the component uh, name, its inputs, its outputs and the data type exactly like uh, the entity of that component has to be repeated. The idea is that uh, you are going to put another component and you are going to connect using some signal and you know that uh, the VHDL is a strict data type checking language. So, if you are connecting an output to an input, uh, if output is of the type standard logic then input also has to be standard logic and this wire or the signal connecting them should be of standard logic. So, we have to declare the distinct components we are using in the uh, for the interconnection in the architecture declaration region all of them and we also have to you see this signal this is not part of the input or output. So, we have to declare that signal it is called signal uh, which is which has no direction because signal connects some output to input one or two inputs one output to one or two inputs uh, normally unless you use a tri state gate. So, uh, the signal does not have a direction, but it has a data type and everything has to match ok. So, uh, the game is uh, uh, you define a top level entity with input output port in the architecture declaration region you declare the components essentially it is name, ports, direction, data type everything various components and what are the internal signal you are going to use that has to be declared because uh, that is not part of the input or output that has to be declared uh, what is the name, what is the data type and when you come to architecture statement region you say how these components are interconnected using this signal or you can say we uh, uh, define a, the netlist of this interconnection ok. We say the component 1 particular output is connected to the component 2 particular input uh, using uh, the, the description language that is the basic idea. So, to make it clear let us take an example we will take the same example ok. We will take uh, the equality comparator we have discussed you know we have described using the uh, uh, the data flow model and the behavioral model. So, we will use the same thing and you know it is a 4 bit equality comparator. So, it needs to check the equality of all the uh, pair of 4 bits a 3 equal to b 3, a 2 equal to b 2, a 1, a 0, b 0 and so on ok. So, this equality is checked by exclusive NOR gates and the output is going to an AND gate if all are 1 the output is 1 ok. So, we have uh, 2 distinct components we have a 2 input exclusive NOR gate and 4 input AND gate ok. Now, we have only 2 components, but this particular uh, 2 input exclusive NOR gate is instantiated 4 times, but we need to declare only once. And AND gate similarly we have a 4 input AND gate which is declared once instantiated once. But mind you we have some signals which is connecting the output of XNOR gate to the input of AND gate. So, these are internal signal this need to be declared ok. So, we have 4 signals um, uh, this 1, 2, 3, 4 that need to be declared. So, we are going to use give a top level entity. Uh, of the equality comparator. In the architecture declaration region we are going to declare a component exclusive NOR and AND gate we are going to uh, declare 4 signals and in the architecture statement region we are going to show this uh, this component will be instantiated 4 times this one time and we will show the connections of the wire connection that means we will say A3 is connected to the first exclusive NOR gate first input B3 is connected to the second input of the first exclusive NOR gate. The first exclusive NOR gate output is connected to the first input of the AND gate and so on ok. We will see how that is done. So, let us go to the VHDL code. Um, see you see um, the entity part is exactly same. We have the library declaration, uh, the package use uh, uh, statement, entity 
exactly similar to the previous one a and b are 4 bit vector equal is a single bit vector ok. When it comes to the architecture um, uh, part you see before the begin there is an architecture declaration and there we are going to declare components and the signals and you see the component um, this component is x nor 2 uh, x nor gate this one and the port is i1 i2 in standard logic 2 inputs of type standard logic o1 colon out standard logic 1 output which is standard logic. And you see normally in architecture NDT there is an is uh, syntax but for some reason VHDL does not have component uh, name is there is 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 missing so do not write is um, it will give an error and here the AND gate is declared so component AND 4 which has 4 inputs and 1 output. So, the port I1, I2, I3, I4 in standard logic O1 is out standard logic. So, normally when you write uh, the description of the AND gate and uh, the XNOR gate uh, this component declaration is exactly like the entity. So, it is enough if you write the component entity and architecture you copy paste the entity here change the entity and n to the you know entity to the component and this entity name to the component and remove the is then you will get it. And this is similar to in a C code uh, when you write uh, a C language uh, program uh, and use a function um, if the function is elsewhere then you write a function prototype ok many a times that you will find in the header file which then checks for the, the type of argument passed and all that. This is something similar because VHDL is a uh, strict data type uh, uh, checking language. So, ultimately we are going to use instantiate this component and connect some wires to it. So, the, the tool will check whatever the wires you are connecting is of the same data type. So, that need to be here you know that is why this component part is here. Uh, we will see how to uh, write a component in the library and use it and all so on. But the basic purpose is that and uh, this component need not be as part of this particular uh, the file it can be elsewhere it can be in a library or it can be elsewhere it does not matter. Now before uh, we declare the signal the syntax is signal name and the data type. So, we have 4 signals which are of the same type we we use uh, uh, you know uh, we specify in the same statement signal in 1 in 2 in 3 in 4 colon standard logic ok. That means that we are naming this as in 1 in 2 in 3 and in 4 that is a game. So, we have declared the 2 components we have declared the signals now we are going to instantiate this 4 times instantiate this 1 time and going to interconnect them that is what is going to be done. So, this is what is shown here um, we connect a 3 b 3 to the first one the output is in 1 a 2 b 2 in 2 a 1 b 1 in 3 a 0 b 0 in 4 and the AND gate get this in 1 in 2 in 3 in 4 and the equals. So, the syntax is simple you give a label some label does not matter colon the component name and we say the port map that means the actual formal ports which we declared as I1 and I2 is mapped to the actual port. So, it we are going to specify a formal to actual mapping that is why it is called port map and we say A of 3, B of 3 and int 1 because we have declared this as I1, I2 and O1 in the same position. So, we are associating A3, B3 and int 1 that is this one. Similarly, C2, X02, port map A2, B2, in 2, A1, B1, in 3 that is this, A0, B0, in 4 that is this one, and ultimately this AND gate which gets in 1, in 2, in 3, in 4 and equals, in 1, in 2, in 3, in 4 equals in the same order, ok. So, this is called a formal to actual mapping 
by position or we can say we are associating uh, the, the actual to the formal you know in a positional way. So, it is called positional association. So, you have to remember the order uh, like you know that the AND gate uh, inputs can be in any order, but then at least you should remember where the input is where the output is. Suppose if we had specified uh, in the declaration uh, uh, equals you know at the, the beginning then we have to you know bring the equals uh, so uh, here you know. So, if the O1 was at the beginning then equals has to be written at the beginning. So, uh, this is kind of done this is how the structural description happens instantiate the components and formal signals are mapped to the actual signal by position. It is very simple there is nothing um, uh, you know great about it and um, but ultimately now we say that this can come from a library or it can come from a different uh, file ultimately uh, there has to be description of the XNOR gate and the AND gate for it to happen it may be in the library already compiled it may be in the project in an another file. Um, but it has to be written sometimes by somebody ok. So, I am for completion sake I am showing that. So, we have uh, the component x 2 library close entity uh, port i 1 i 2 and o 1 and the architecture we have very simple statement o 1 gets i 1 x 0 i 2 and that is the end of the architecture. Similarly, you have an AND gate which is 4 input i 1 i 2 i 3 i 4 in standard logic O1 is out standard logic. In the architecture declaration statement region we have O1 gets I1 and I2 and I3 and I4. So, it is simple as it is. So, if you write this and uh, you know you compile it uh, this will, will be same as uh, the, uh, the behavioral code or the data flow uh, model and so on. Uh, at this point somebody might ask uh, is there a difference between um, the earlier code and this code which gives a better circuit. At least for the simple uh, very simple cases like this it does not matter at all. But when you write a very complex uh, uh, circuit using behavioral uh, the data flow and the structural code um, you can get different circuit. Uh, it depends how you understand. Uh, how you describe uh, and things like that. So, we cannot say, uh, but if you follow the strict practices uh, what I am going to um, uh, you know teach you then uh, you, you can be sure that you will get uh, the kind of the expected circuit with maybe some kind of optimization uh, in all 3 cases. You need not worry at least in simple case you can close your eyes and choose uh, there is no need to frankly if you are making an equality comparator there is absolutely no need to write a structural code just to illustrate because if I take an uh, example complex example it runs into pages and uh, just to illustrate I have used a very simple code but you do not do that you know you, there is no point in write uh, you know making a ripple adder or a, a equality comparator using a structural code when you have complex design. Uh, which is partitioned into multiple pieces uh, then those partitions are combined in a structural code you know top level or the level second level and so on. But when you come down uh, you can still use the, the behavioral and the data flow description uh, when you really describe the, the known uh, high level functions as we discussed like mux, dmux, encoder, decoder, uh, adder, subtractor all that can be described behaviorally or in a data flow model and when we come up when you put it together use the structural coding that will be easy to kind of uh, keep track of then uh, again come you can combine them in a behavioral uh, way, but then it is it can be complicated to track um, uh, it is easy to use a structural coding at the top level when you connect uh, the, the complex blocks together ok. So, let us move on let us see some kind of uh, yeah, uh, the this let us look at this component instantiation. The way we have done the positional association is like x 0 2 port map 
then I1 is mapped to A3, I2 is mapped to B3, and O1 is mapped to INF1 uh, positional association. But when you this is okay if if you are writing the code and the code is in the same file. Suppose you have written the X02 code that is in the same file you can scroll down and check the order of the, the formal uh, ports then you can map it correctly. But when somebody has written a library uh, component in a library it is very difficult to keep track of the order. Uh, but they can give an input output table where the input signal name and the data type is described and the function is described. So, it will be convenient if you can um, forget about the, the order of the, uh, the ports we can say uh, what is the formal port name and what is the actual port name association can be specified explicitly that is called named association which is the most useful way of uh, you know doing the port map. So, that is like this you know you can say for the previous case this case you can say x02 port map uh, o1 is mapped to int1 i2 is mapped to b3 i1 is mapped to a3 exactly similar to this you do not have to keep any order you correctly say which formal uh, port is mapped to which actual part that is it ok. So, that is the named association the most useful way of uh, you know describing uh, the component instantiation. So, let us move on you know that when you write uh, some software code um, uh, like if you are a computer science student or you have written some serious software uh, one important thing before you uh, write the code is the data structure ok. So, algorithm you have the, the proper data structure if you define uh, then the code will be very easy you can have an elegant um, uh, the C code if the data structure is correct where you are supposed to use an array if you use a kind of uh, uh, distinct variable set of distinct variables the code will be very clumsy. So, uh, similar to that in VHDL if you define the signals in a proper way the code can be very elegant and concise. Uh, so, I am going to show the same structural code we have written I will introduce a slight change and show you how it can simplify the code how it can make elegant uh, uh, you know make the code elegant. So, let us move on. So, we have declared uh, earlier the internal signals as 4 distinct uh, signals called in 1, in 2, in 3 and in 4 ok. Uh, you remember that uh, suppose instead of that uh, I am going to declare uh, this signal as a 4 bit vector ok or 4 bit array or whatever 4 bit bus ok. So, I am not calling int 1, int 2, int 3, int 4. Uh, so, I am calling the signal I int ok uh, which is standard logic vector 3 down to 0 that means you have an int of 3, int of 2, int of 1 and int of 0. The moment I write like that then what I do is that earlier code was written like this a3, b3 and int1. So, I could write now instead of that I have changed the declaration to a bus which is 4 bit. Now, I am going to change the de, uh, you know description uh, which say x0 to port map a of 3, b of 3 and int of 3 a2, b2, int2, a1, b1, int1 a0 b0 in 0 in the 4 uh, you know the uh, the component instantiation or the xnor gates and in the in the in the and gate the inputs are in 3 in 2 in 1 in 0 in any order and the equals ok now you see here uh, this comes neatly you know you have 3 3 3 2 2 2 so you can write something called for this four statements you can write a loop called generate loop. So, that is written shown here for i in 0 to 3 generate c x0 to port map a of i b of i int of i that means it goes from a0 b0 int of 0 a1 b1 int 1 a2 b2 int 2 a3 b3 int 3 you might ask what happened to the label we are not giving c of i 
you do not need to give you just give uh, C you will automatically get C0, C1, C2, C3 ok do not worry about the, the label and ultimately you have to, to write the, uh, the instantiation of the AND gate. Now mind you uh, this is not a loop uh, in a conventional sense of the sequential language because in a sequential language uh, you know something is kind of executed one after the other but this is just a short form of writing it explicitly when the, the, the compiler tool see this it will replicate it 4 times like you know A0, B0, IN0 up to A3, B3. So it is a, it's a very concise way of uh, you know generating this statement. So if you take care when you write the code when you, when you have something replicated with some symmetry it has to be symmetrical and a proper definition of the signal can help you in getting a very simple concise code and which is easy to kind of understand and uh, otherwise you have to suppose you have something replicated uh, you know 12 times then you have this issue ok. So you can think of doing this for suppose you have a ripple adder uh, where the full adder is replicated 8 times you can write a generate loop. Uh, you might need to, uh, to define the signal the carry input and carry output you know that need to be taken care but that can be easily taken care. So that is one example uh, of uh, this generate loop you can definitely write a generate loop for an 8 bit ripple adder using the component as a, as a full adder but suppose if you use a carry lookout adder uh, that is going to be little tough you know because in a carry lookout adder it is not symmetric when you move from uh, 0 to 7. Uh, it becomes exponentially bigger and you can do that you can write a loop uh, but probably not a generate loop maybe we will see what to be what to be done uh, when you go ahead. And one more thing uh, about instantiation when suppose you are instantiating a component and one of the output is not connected ok. Then when you instantiate uh, suppose um, see we are using a 4 input AND gate uh, the uh, or you say equality comparator with 3 output one is equal to one is greater than one is less than and we are using only equal to in, in the instantiation. Then when you uh, come to the greater output and less output uh, when you instantiate you have to say uh, since it is not used you have to say open. And similarly if some inputs are like you have using an in some case you are using only the 3 inputs of an AND gate then one of the input has to be uh, tied to you know 0 the inactive level depending on whether the function is AND or OR ok. So you have to, to properly uh, tie it to the appropriate logic levels when an input is uh, not used otherwise things would work uh, because we are describing the hardware. So that need to be taken care. So let us, uh, so that is about the different models of description. Uh, the structural coding is what we have looked at basically we instantiate, we declare components, declare internal signal instantiate it and uh, interconnect them by describing the interconnection using the internal signals and ports. And if you elegantly define signals you can uh, you know use the kind of concise elegant uh, generate loops uh, for a you know kind of when there is quite quite a good symmetry you can work it out it becomes concise and if an output is not used you have to say open input is not used then you have to pull it up or pull it down uh, depending on the function of the circuit uh, to the to make it inactive. Uh, so let us move on now that is the 3 different models of description. Now let us look at the, the simulation ok. Um, I do not know whether uh, you have done any digital simulation maybe in your uh, the undergraduate you have done uh, the analog simulation using SPICE and um, so in a SPICE simulation suppose you have a system maybe a filter uh, let us take an ex example of a low pass filter and you give some input say maybe some trapezoid uh, waveform and you will definitely the low pass filter depending on the cutoff frequency is going to smooth it out you will get a triangle wave or a 
sine wave depending on uh, uh, what how the filter is designed. But in a you know that in a uh, spy simulation it is going to divide the whole uh, period into to minute intervals okay. Uh, it need not be uniform because uh, you know in a trapezoidal waveform maximum information is in this kind of uh, slope all the harmonics uh, uh, the frequency content comes because of this kind of uh, rate of change. So, there will be lot of division lot of steps there when it is stable maybe less steps. So, the spice is going to divide it into, into the interval and there will be computation of the, the input with the system uh, transfer function to generate the output okay. So, that is how the, uh, uh, the analog simulation or the spy simulation is done. So, um, let us see how it is different um, for a digital circuit okay. Now, look at a digital circuit. So, uh, you see here uh, I have shown some like you can imagine this is a digital uh, system now and we are giving some input to the uh, to the system okay. Now, uh, you see here uh, this input is changing like that and this one is changing like this okay. Now, suppose initially at the first step uh, uh, the simulator take these values 0 and 1 and compute the output. But you know the moment it is computed there is no point in dividing this into minute intervals and compute it because it is going to be stable because the digital system is binary. But here you see when, when an analog signal, analog signal changes the value moves from all the values are important. Uh, it may be going from maybe 0 to plus 15 volt each voltage is important, but in our case either 0 then 1. So, there is no need to compute once uh, 0 1 is computed uh, the next computation need to be need to happen only here because the input signal is changed from 0 to 1. So, now you compute here at this point 1 1 the moment you compute till any change happens there is no need to compute because it is going to remain stationary. So, as far as digital circuit is simulated simulation is digital simulation is concerned whenever there is a change in the input at that point the simulator need to compute okay. That means, whenever we say whenever there is an event on in any of the signal at that time the computation should happen okay. So, the in digital simulation is an event driven simulation whenever there is an event on any of the signal then the simulator has to compute otherwise nothing to do okay. So, events uh, trigger the computation and events can be on the inputs maybe event happens uh, like you give the inputs to various input uh, input signal uh, then you have to compute. But because of the input something can change internally at that time also uh, that should trigger a computation. So, in digital circuit unlike the analog circuit we use event driven uh, simulation like you take a combinatorial circuit then we have to simulate by uh, you know the uh, it is an event driven simulation. But let us come to the sequential circuit. Uh, now, when you have a sequential circuit suppose the input is changing quite a bit. Uh, suppose we give a clock which is say uh, of uh, frequency uh, say 100 megahertz then the duration is 10 nanosecond. Uh, but maybe the all the inputs coming to this uh, register. Uh, say we have a register combination circuit and a register. Here the input is changing say every 1 nanosecond, but we know that this flip flop is going to be latched every 10 nanosecond. So, there is no point in computing uh, the simulator to compute every 1 nanosecond okay. Uh, so, uh, in principle for a sequential circuit you can compute uh, on the active clock ends. Uh, and you can get the value and that is called uh, cycle based simulation. Every clock cycle active clock edge you can do the computation definitely you will miss a lot of things because of maybe that uh, there could be a uh, lot of changes happening here uh, and unless that is all computed uh, the in between things can be lost. But then uh, this is a very quick way of simulating you, you do not simulate 
uh, you know every time the input changes when the clock comes um, just before the, the kind of that you whatever is the in stable input that time only you need to, to compute. Uh, but you might you know you may not be able to estimate the, the power dissipation and things like that in the simulation or something will be missing. But uh, uh, does not matter for sequential circuit because updation happens only on the clock head. So, the cycle based simulator simulation can be used in sequential circuit. So, that is a different type of simulation and in simulation there is a notion or a, a terminology we use simulation time okay. Now uh, you should you should have some clarity on that. Uh, first of all it is not real time okay it is not that uh, it is the time of the day or some kind of clock which is running uh, which indicates uh, the real time okay that is not the simulation time. So, real time is not simulation time it is not even the time taken by the simulator to compute something say you say you have given a, a, a complex circuit for a timing simulation it takes 3 hours to simulate whatever you have given that is not the time taken by the simulator is not the simulation time. Simulation time basically is the, uh, the time uh, at which the events happen okay. So, when you say at 100 nanosecond an event uh, an input A changes then we say uh, the simulation time is 100 nanosecond okay. Then uh, the simulator will start some computation which might take any amount of time uh, like at 100 nanosecond an event happens and simulator computes maybe it will compute in few nanosecond or microsecond or millisecond or hours or day it does not matter. Uh, it might take a day for the computation of the 100 nanosecond event if the, the circuit is complex okay. Now after the day everything uh, is done if the next event in, in the queue is 200 nanosecond the simulation time now goes from 100 nanosecond to 200 nanosecond okay as far as the digital simulation is concerned because it is event based the next event in the queue in the order is 200 nanosecond the simulation time goes from 100 nanosecond to the 200 nanosecond. So, that is the simulation time do not confuse. Uh, now, I am giving a very uh, kind of lucid explanation for you to understand the concept. I am not going to be very uh, precise I am going to avoid all the terminologies. You can go back to some textbook there are a lot of uh, you know uh, the names the terminology which is used with regard to simulation I am avoiding everything you can refer to the to the reference book and learn all that but it could be confusing for a, a beginner to go through that i am telling you the crux of the matter in a very very lucid way so i cannot be very um, kind of precise but i'm trying to explain the concept in a, in a clear way uh, hopefully you can uh, understand and very important is that events are ordered uh, in that in the in the chronological order or in the simulation time that what that is what I mean is that suppose you are trying to simulate a circuit and you have given uh, say uh, you have an AND gate you are trying to simulate and two inputs are there. Say you give some waveform which changes at 100 nanosecond, 200 nanosecond, 250 nanosecond and 300 nanosecond the simulator will uh, you know order the events like 100, uh, 200, 300 like that you know in the in the order. But suppose this AND gate is driving another uh, OR gate the AND gate output is driving another OR gate. Now because of change in the, the input of the AND gate 100 nanosecond output changes may be after say 101 nanosecond okay. So, when the simulator computes earlier simulator had say 3 events at the input of AND gate 100, 200 and 300. But when it simulates it find that the output of the AND gate because of the 100 nanosecond change has changed at 103 nanosecond. So, now it has to add an event between 100 and 200 at 103. Then only the, uh, the next OR gate behavior can be simulated properly. So, that is what I mean the events as it happens like when the simulation happens maybe there are you give some inputs 
some events and it is ordered properly but the simulator as it simulates new uh, events happen in the internal signal that is pushed in bit at the appropriate place in the correct order and one by one the input is taken and simulated. So, that should be understood you the best thing is that you draw a some 2 or 3 level circuit and you imagine some input and uh, you try to, to compute and order it in the proper way then you will understand it, it very it is better you yourself work it out I could have shown a picture maybe as we go along some pictures will be shown which is related from there you can grasp. So, that is idea of simulation time so do not uh, get con confused and there is some uh, uh, the most uh, textbook will talk about a simulation cycle basically uh, it shows a, a resolving the concurrency by sequential computation ok and they will call you know uh, describe something called delta delay we will see that uh, in a moment ok. So, uh, let us move on let us see how uh, the simulator simulates uh, the sequentially written code or the concurrent behavior uh, is, is simulated uh, properly. So, please have a look at uh, the circuit which is shown here. So, here we have uh, a very simple circuit an AND gate and a NOR gate and A B is going to an AND gate and the output of the AND gate is X x is x and c primary input is going to a NOR gate which is output is a y and the AND gate has a delay of 3 nanosecond and the NOR gate has a delay of 5 nanosecond and we know that the AND gate 1 1 is 1 for the NOR gate if any input is 1 uh, the output is 0 because it is opposite of OR gate. Now we have not learned about how to specify the delay in VHDL. But this is the way to specify it we are writing the description but we are not writing uh, the statement concurrent statement in the order of the data flow data is flowing from a b to x x and c to y. But we are going to write uh, this this part first and this part second say y gets c nor x after 5 nanosecond that is this one and this is the way to add a delay the model the delay in VHDL only for simulation just like if you write a statement like after 5 nanosecond uh, definitely you are not going to get a NOR gate with 5 nanosecond delay. If you give it to a synthesis tool it is going to generate some circuit like this ignoring this is not going to give any delay you know it or it gives uh, if you go to FPGA it will map to some circuit whatever may be the delay of the circuit you get it ok. There is uh, this is not for synthesis it is only for simulation. But if you simulate this circuit it will definitely show the output will come after 5 nanosecond delay ok. Now x is a and b after 3 nanosecond. Now you see that the y is written first and x is written um, after that. So the, the order of the statement is opposite to the order of the, uh, the way the data is flowing. Now normally as in sequential language simulation if the simulator looks at the like if there is an event on A it computes a Y first then X uh, then nothing is going to happen you know because the Y say C nor X after 5 nanosecond whatever was the old value of X is used for Y computation. But X is computed and uh, where the new value of A is used and X is correctly computed Y is not correct and you can imagine uh, what happens if you have a 5 level circuit and everything is jumbled up ok. So, uh, this is a little bit hopeless uh, situation we have to make the simulator has to make some sense out of it ok. Now, we cannot say that you look at the, uh, the order in which the data is flowing and rearrange the statements and so on. This will not work uh, definitely because you can have a feedback ok. So, when uh, like suppose uh, you have something uh, one more level and the output is going back to the input then what is the order when there is a feedback uh, there is no order it is like um, uh, you go to a stadium where a running race is in the progress ok. Uh, you go you know people have a running a so say 
a long distance 10,000 meter running in a 400 meter track and you go in the middle and if you look and you might guess saying that somebody is in the front maybe the uh, you will imagine the tail tail ender is the is the topper top end like that you know so similar thing in a in a when you have a cycle you cannot decide which is the first so ordering it in a proper way is impossible so but if you think um, uh, it is very easy because uh, you know you know that the computation start because of an event if an event happens on a then the best thing to do is instead of going from top to bottom look at the right hand side of the assignment wherever there is a you compute that so that is a game and there could be multiple statement with a it does not matter suppose the simulation time is 100 nanosecond at 100 nanosecond you compute x and there may be an z with a you compute z really does not matter ok. Whatever I am going to show you is a simple case but that can be kind of um, interpolated uh, to, a, to a more complex case only you need to work it out ok. So, the rule of resolving concurrency is very simple look at the right hand side of the assignment wherever there is an event and compute that ok. Now, you take this simple case let us assume that A is changing at 100 nanosecond. So, a, suppose initially A was 1 1 the x is 1. So, A is changing from 1 to 0 then look at the, the simulator will look at the right hand side there is an event on A and you look at the right hand side here there is nothing. So, this need not be computed. So, A changed at 100 nanosecond. So, it will compute a new value of x and it will assign at 100 plus 3 nanosecond 1 or 3 nanosecond. The moment that happens now some signal has changed. Now, again the simulator will look where the x has changed at 1 or 3 nanosecond. So, what the simulator does is that the current simulation time is 100 nanosecond and there is a 100 nanosecond event it has computed uh, some signal uh, you know some assignment for 1 or 3 nanosecond. If nothing else need to be computed for 100 nanosecond it will it will keep the event in order. So, suppose the next event on x was 200 nanosecond. Now, since there is a sorry uh, the a is 200 nanosecond since there is an event on x at 103 nanosecond it will look at the right and simulation time is forwarded to 103 nanosecond. It will look where x happens and you know compute the y and that will happen after 103 plus y nanosecond. Again it looks if there is anything remaining to be computed for 103 nanosecond and proceed for the next uh, simulation time 108 nanosecond and so on ok. That is how uh, the simulator uh, resolve the concurrency it does not matter it does not matter however many statements are there whether there is feedback in whichever order and instead of the AND gauge there are very complex circuit this game works you know the anything uh, can be easily the um, uh, the concurrency is resolved by very simple method of looking at the right hand side of assignment where the event happens that is computed and new event happens that is ordered properly and it proceeds. So, that is what is shown here. So, we have at the time 0 a and b are 1. So, x is 1 c is 0. So, because of x 1 y is 0. Now, at the 100 nanosecond B remains there A changes from 1 to 0. So, the moment that happens uh, this A appears at the right hand side X need to be computed. So, X is assigned a value because A is going from 1 to 0 X will go from 1 to 0, but that happens at 103 nanosecond and Y remains same uh, because, um, uh, uh, because at 103 um, the y y y is you know there uh, there is no change in the x at this point at 100 nanosecond. So, y does not change. Now, since there is nothing else here to compute at 100 nanosecond the simulation time moves from 100 to 103 and there is an event now on x that will you look at the right hand side that will trigger a computation for y and that uh, you know the uh, that is basically 0 nor 0 which is nothing but 1. 
So, the y will change from 0 to 1 which is assigned at 103 plus 5 nanosecond 108 nanosecond. Since there is nothing remain to be computed at 103 uh, the simulation times move to 108 nanosecond and everything is stabilized. So, if you put a waveform uh, uh, this comes very cleanly. So, basically um, the resolving the game is about resolving the uh, you know the concurrency uh, the issue is order of the statement will not uh, match the, 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 the data flow uh, the order may not may be different and the solution is an event driven computation and uh, you look at the right hand side of assignment and uh, one after the other you compute and that might trigger uh, the further events and you, you order them properly and uh, you know uh, then you treat them one by one everything is work properly. If you have any doubt uh, you can really uh, you know I have definitely shown some very simple case you can introduce say uh, like event um, on A at 100 nanosecond at 1 or 110 nanosecond 120 nanosecond. You can even think of a scenario where A is changing at 100 nanosecond and also at 102 nanosecond before even the exchanges. Okay. So, you think uh, really what happens you know you try to work out such a situation that will bring uh, clarity to your thinking and so this shows uh, essentially what I have told is that how uh, a simulator resolve the concurrency from the sequentially written statement it might it is a very simple idea it is not a very complicated idea. But the, uh, the simulator may have to compute quite a lot a lot of computation need to be done but the idea is very simple uh, whenever there is an event uh, look at the right hand side compute those statement which is an event assign the output order the events sequentially properly and uh, then uh, when every computation at the particular simulation time stabilizes go to the next uh, uh, event next simulation time and keep computing that is a basic idea. So, with that uh, I try to uh, complete uh, today's lecture. The second part of the lecture shown we have discussed the simulation how an a spy simulation happens for analog circuit by you know kind of uh, discretizing the signal at various intervals uh, depending on the need of computation. But in digital circuit you do not need to kind of uh, you know uh, introduce intervals wherever whenever there is a change in the, uh, the inputs that need to be recomputed. So, the events uh, whenever there that is an event driven simulation and for sequ sequential circuit basically you can do whenever on uh, the cycle based simulation on the active clock edge that will reduce the computation. And we have seen uh, a simulation cycle how a simulator resolve the concurrency in the case of timing simulation ok. We will in the next lecture we will see how that happens in a logic simulation where there is no delay that will definitely bring more clarity to the game. Uh, so, I stop here please go back and uh, revise whatever is done refer to the textbook to get hold of the, uh, the terminology used because I have avoided uh, to explain the concept in a, in a very simple and lucid way. Uh, so, please revise refer to the textbook uh, thank you and I wish you all the best.